Hey everybody and welcome to a new episode of Indie Film Cafe's Criterion Watch. Criterion Watch. And uh, I'm your old pal the Moo Cow, a.k.a. Polly Presenza, and I'm joined by... Jonathan A. Moody, your co-host. And uh, Product Placement Co. Give us some money. And we are gathered together to watch a movie. This is a classic from the 80s and is a David Cronenberg movie. Oh, Videodrome. David, David Cronenberg, man. David Cronenberg and Lynch. Those two yep. are the two Davids that work really well in Criterion. Yep, James Wood and Deborah Harry and a few other folks. And um, yeah, this was, I remember seeing this in the theater when it came out and I was like blown away. It was amazing. And David Cronenberg loves his body horror and mm -hmm. that's, that stuff always makes me feel icky and weird. <laughs> but it's really, really good. And this is kind of like the, the movie that sort of brought body harmor to, to mainstream cinema as I see it. Right. So. And you were thinking like, you know, uh, that we might have done this or whatever. I thought we might I think I think I had um, thought of it or something for like What the Fuck Friday, you know, because I don't really have that many Because it's what a the classic film. But it is a What the Fuck. Oh, yeah. Know, totally. So I, I get that. So I, you know, I, I'm excited to see it. You, you know, I, I've seen like a good amount of it. I just never got to finish it. So, and it's fun because you know I saw it when it first came out, and then back in Newark at the uh, the old State Theater, they would show it every now and again. But that was back when I was in college, and then mm -hmm. I haven't been there in years, and I hadn't really, I didn't have a version of it until the Criterion came out. So, I only recently watched it for the first time in at least twenty years. So. It was really, really cool. So this is a 4K Blu-ray combo. There you so go. So it's got both. Thank God it's got both because we only have the Blu-ray player here. But, uh, yeah, that's awesome. So you got the both. The, I, I remember when you bought this because it was at the mm -hmm. Barnes & Noble in Williamsburg or whatever. I was really if, excited. Yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those movies that um, – and it's kind of perfect because the Criterion sale is coming next month. Mm. So get ready for that, everybody. Um, All right. So. Well, we'll be back to talk about this film uh, in a few minutes on the flip side, right? Yep, on the flip side, everybody. Bye. <laughs> kind of works with us because I was thinking about this the other, like, earlier. Yeah. I said, where did this come from? Somebody put this like this. We don't know who. Videodrome. Videodrome did it. Yeah. Um, so what did you think of Videodrome? This is the first time you saw the whole thing all the way through, right? Uh, yeah. You know what's interesting? I don't remember any of it. Like, even if I saw some of it, I don't remember huh. where I stopped or, or whatnot. Um, so it's weird. Um, I could believe it because if you didn't see the whole thing, I don't understand. I, you really wouldn't be able to understand it. I don't, I don't think. think I would have liked watching it by myself um, because it's it's not a movie that it, it's a movie that like engages thought and everything. Like you can, you got to watch this with somebody else and talk about it mm -hmm. afterwards, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, because you know the idea is that you know he James Woods's character somewhere along the line crosses a boundary, and when he crosses that boundary, reality as he knows it and as we see it ceases to exist, and it all becomes mixed up. Right. And I think it's a little different for various people. I think different people are going to look at it differently, and it's interesting. It's it's kind of like. You know, David Cronenberg is saying, you know, we're all going to be going through that in the future. And especially if we, if, if, if his political idea is the same, and we all are becoming pawns of one side or the other. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to know what side we're part of and or even care if, if, you know, mass commercialism is anything to go with. Because that was another thing in the 80s that everybody was talking about. It's got a lot of stuff going on in this. This is not yeah. just a regular horror film where you've got a, you know, the point is to just throw out scares and yucks and that's it. And mm -hmm. it, there's a lot more going on. Yeah, I like that. Um, it's kind of a movie where you just sort of like start realizing like what was real, what mm -hmm. wasn't. Did I really watch this movie? Am, mm -hmm. am I uh, am I hallucinating? You know, as a, you know, uh, and the whole idea like. Um, that especially back in the 80s, I guarantee you, um, they were sort of people were sort of afraid of like what people would watch and what would because there was a lot of that time there was people talking about like I think even in the movie they mentioned like you know aren't you afraid that the people who see 
the torture and all of these other things are going to go out and do that. Kill people, right. And kill people. And he says, no, you know, like this is gives them an outlet to watch that stuff instead of, yeah. you know, It's like Dungeons it. and Dragons. They were like, oh, people, kids who play Dungeons and Dragons are going to grow up and kill people. It's like, no. It was a satanic panic. Yeah, satanic know? panic or kids who listen to rock and roll music. You know, especially the the heavy metal, we're going to go out and kill people. No, but there was a lot of fear behind stuff because it's it's basically stuff people don't understand. So it, we're afraid it, it, it. When it's new, especially yeah. people don't understand it. And even though TV had been out for a while, um, they're ta talking cable. more about like cable right. and and the fact that there were companies, there were smaller cable companies that were able to do the stuff that. Um, you know, other companies weren't able to do. Mm. And um, I think it's more fitting for now to look back at this now because, like, we have so many outlets, we have so many ways that people can view content that, um, you know, how do people monitor it? You know, how do people mm. keep, you know, make sure that. Especially you know, with virtual reality and with AI and all these other new concepts, which is why I'm saying, you know, this, this is ripe. For a remake, as long as it's you know David Cronenberg or you know his family, somebody who understands mm. the the material and can redo it for more technologically. I mean, there are other filmmakers age. that are kind of similar. Like I could see, I could see the director of The Witch and yeah. stuff doing something like this or, yeah. or remaking or, it. Or um, you know, or uh, oh god, what's his name? Del Toro. The, Del the Toro, Guillermo Del him Toro. I could see. Um, uh, I think the the director of um, uh, what is it the other uh, the guy that we watched for the lobster like he would oh, have, yeah. he would have a blast the, with yeah the Greek guy I forget Yorgos his name. Uh, yeah. yeah he would have a blast with this so mm -hmm. there's so many people who could do a remake of this that they would do it respectfully and tastefully and and, they and would it's do not a good like job. the internet didn't exist in '83 it did it just didn't really become the mass thing that it is now. Right. You know, I mean, I remember in high school, you know, they actually taught us a little bit of uh, computer programming, the very, very basic basics of basic, you know, and it was, I remember doing that and thinking, oh, wow, this is what I'm going to be doing forever. No. <laughs> it changed, it evolved. Yeah, it, it, like that. It was just amazing. And I think that's what's so great about Videodrome is because if Videodrome evolved, you know, mm -hmm. everything you thought you saw or thought was going on change like you know all of a sudden and all his hallucinations just like you know one point or another he changed and uh it's just interesting because you know having lived through that period i have a lot more context with what's going on and a lot more understanding whereas you know you take a 20 year old now who didn't live back then and they don't they don't have that context they're not going to get it they're not going to they're going to look at that and say this was just a bunch of old technology that doesn't exist anymore this doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> you were pointing out like there was a big phone there was the big right. tv <laughs> i mean everything was the big so, 80s glasses and uh, a, a vr set that was like oh it was like, huge huge yeah. over his head Everything was so big back then, and now everything is so tiny. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, your phone, the phone I'm using right now to record this on is tiny. Oh, it's you know? it's even more powerful than any of the computers they had yeah. mass marketed back then. I know. So, like, or, you know, it's even the digital age is be better than the film age, you know, and everything. People are now going to digital. The, now there are people like Tarantino who's pro, you know, uh, film forever, and right. he's just one of those cranky old, you know, get off my lawn kind of filmmakers who's never going to change, and that's fine because as long as he's still able to do it, you know, that's it's, great. It's an interesting though antiquated vision of the future. It's just that that particular future didn't last very long. I mean, it doesn't even mention cell phones and. You know, 5G is really kind of the thing that a lot of people are afraid of, you know, doing weird things to your head and weird signals and kind of goofy and horse shit really like did. that. No. no. Um, but people are afraid of yeah. that and they don't understand it. And they <laughs> think that that's what they think it's the government's way of making you go off and do shit. And it's yeah. like, no. No, no, no. So it's just weird. But it's, it's interesting that it taps into that. Yeah. That's the timelessness part of it because... 
you know, 30 years from now, there's going to be a whole series of other new stuff that's going to come through and the same fears from the same kinds of people who don't understand it and don't trust it are just going to assume the worst and they're going to run with it and it's going to be this this constant thing in our society about the people who want to progress and go on to the new thing with the people who are afraid of that because they think, you know, I guess given human nature that it's going to be all for the worst. And sometimes it is, but for the most part it's not. You know, I mean, there's going to be that subculture like the guys, you know, he's got this little this little cable TV thing that panders to this small subgroup of people who like the weird pervy stuff. There's always going to be that group out there. Mm-hmm. But that's not most people. So the fear... I don't know how he makes money off of that, though. Because, yeah. like, yeah, it is a small group. You yeah, know, so. I, I couldn't tell you. But I remember back in the day, I mean, there was... Uh, I remember before, you if you didn't have cable and you lived in New York City, you could actually get a local TV show that actually did... Uh, like pornographic stuff and and violent stuff. I, I remember that back then. Um, but but outside of New York City, I mean, you didn't have that. Maybe L.A. had something like that, but I think it was just New York City at that point. And it's all completely different now. Now the you know the internet has changed everything. Binge watching has changed everything. There was no Netflix or streaming of any kind back then. Yeah. And, it's a, it's a completely different world. God, the, the world of porn was completely different. Now anybody can just jump on at any point anywhere and just, and just go make their anywhere. own porn, yeah. And just and find it. I and mean, find it, yeah. I mean, back then, you know, if you were a teenager in the 80s, the only thing, if you didn't live next to a big city that happened to have a, a porn store, was to get one of those cable shows that you couldn't. You know, like Skinamax, yeah. and if you didn't, and it was like all jammed up with a signal, and you'd be like that, you know, for like ten minutes to try I've and see, a, try and see a boob. <laughs> Illegal channel. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, you might get lucky, and you might have like two minutes of where it's actually, you know, for real, and you can actually see something in a snowy picture, and then it would just, you know, jam back, up again. Yeah. It was yeah. funny. People, people don't understand. That's what it was like back then. It was just funny. So. I guess we'll go through the story a little bit, like, throughout it or whatever, and we'll, we'll touch up on specific stuff. But, like, you know, the beginning of the movie is uh, he has the the main guy, Max. Max. Um, he, played by James Woods, is basically trying to find something something new, something something for his cable company. The next big the thing. The next big thing. And he's he has this one, the beginning has, like, this one called Samurai Dreams, and it just seemed... Just softcore porn kind of shit, you know, like not inter- not that entertaining or 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 kind of mad. Kind of mad. So he's like, let me try to find something else. So they figure they'll pirate, you know, something. You know, they'll find something on a pirate uh, television, and they uh, find this thing, and they find out it's called Videodrome, and it's uh, originally they think it's from Malaysia, but then they figure out it's from Pittsburgh, and so then. They, uh, she, he gets his agent lady, the the lady who finds, who tries to find all these things. She's a really sweet, um, older lady, who wants to find, um, you know, she wants, she wanted to do something else, right? She wanted to do some other kind of thing, but she was, he was like, that's just too nice, you know. We need something, we need something graphic. We need like video drum. You gotta find me who makes video drum and everything. And um, they find out that the person to talk to is this guy oblivion whom he's already been on the show with along with deborah harry's character yeah and then we find out deborah harry wants to audition for video drone because she's a perv she's she's a kinky perv perv. she's a kinky perv she likes to get (laughs) she likes to get cut by a guy she likes to just you know you got squeamish when she put the cigarette out of the boob i did not like that yeah that was that was rough i mean i'm sure that i'm sure they had something like some makeup thing to make it you know, so she could do that and not obviously. There's a lot of body horror in this. It's it's a little weird and kind of tame by today's standards, but I'm telling you, in 1983, on a on a on a big screen TV, I, was, I don't yeah. know. I, even today, I think some people would be like, ah, you know. Sure. Um, so then, uh, basically, he finds out. You know, Oblivion knows about this Professor Oblivion, so he goes to find him, and uh, his daughter gives him tapes that oblivion has and that's going to help him and so he uh checks out the the tapes and it's just basically 
Professor Oblivion talking to him, but it starts making him hallucinate more. You know. Yeah, and there's this whole weird, wacky, new agey, churchy sort of thing where they, it's the the church of the cathode ray, and there's all this stuff about, you know, the the uh, signal produces tumors in your brain, and then the tumors like a third eye that is opening up new realities to people but it turns out it's all a setup and the, with the government and there's other yeah, stuff there's a going political on. thing and that's what the lady says the lady tells him mm -hmm. don't look into this because right. he was warned he was warned don't look into this because it is way bigger than what you think it is right and we shouldn't touch this and of course you know? that just makes him want to go even yeah. more because that's you know, him you don't tell somebody not to touch something then they're going to want to touch it you know, if somebody said, don't touch that. No, yeah, or don't yeah. touch the screen skull. Yeah, exactly. And then you're just one, like, why not? You know, let me touch it. And then Especially you, James Wood's character. I mean, that's, and then you get shocked, and then you're like, oh, I shouldn't have touched that. Like, I shouldn't have done What if it does well, it again? Yeah, you know, right? It's so dumb. Um, but that's what that's what he does. He, he touches the green skull. He does the stupid shit you shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. And so he ends up um, getting, you know, hallucinating and freaking out. And then he thinks it's all just like some kind of weird like, thing. That's the point where Cronenberg is playing with us because he's also subverting our point of view and not letting us know what we're watching. If we're watching exactly. reality or dream, somewhere in between, a mix of the two, neither one. It's hard to say. So he goes back to the church to talk to, uh, he wants to talk to Oblivion, I think. Oblivion's daughter says, you know, oh. so you watch the tape, okay, yeah. you know, yeah, and now okay. it's time for you to meet my dad. You go into the room, his dad, her dad's been dead. You know, the, it, all he is right now is he's, a bunch of tapes. Yeah, he's alive in like 5,000 videotapes. Yeah, so this is all that's left of him is all these pre-recorded videotapes. But it's weird because it's pre-recorded, but yet the guy's talking to him. He's mm -hmm. dead. How can that happen? Unless that was part those, of those, his those, the, yeah, the hallucination. His hallucination. Mm -hmm. So it's all of it starting, you know, that started with that, you know. So I can see somebody out there right now scribbling down a script for 5G zombies. I can see it happening. It's already done. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Dustin Ferguson did Oh, God. Or <laughs> uh, had an involvement with that. Um, not so, surprised. yeah. So then... Um, yeah, so after that, um, you know, he, uh, he gets, like, he starts getting freak. you know, like, hallucinations start coming to be a part of the big thing. That's what the, the daughter, like, kind of explains or whatever. Meanwhile, uh, Deborah Harry's character's been gone, you know, and had decided to go. Uh, I guess the, the secretary told them that she was, mm -hmm. uh, had... It wasn't actually sent there that she had taken vacation and decided to go go Bad there and, and do that. Um, but did she or did she not? Oh, we she went. Are you she, sure? She went, yeah. Because they say that, but then I'm like, is that a hallucination? Yeah, no, I real? think that was part of the thing that really happened. That really happened is yeah. that she, because the other girl told her that, mm. like that she was gone and that she's been dead for a while and, and they've they been using the it in your, yeah. using the image. Uh, for your uh, hallucinations. Poor Deborah Harry. Yeah. Um, Although she was kind of a sad case, really. Yeah, she was. She was messed up beyond repair. Eesh. You know. Um, and you know, it's kind of like several of the themes in this film are really between the two of them. There's the overstimulation mm -hmm. by everything, everything that we want—drugs or sex or booze or whatever—overstimulation and gratification, and then. The second thing I think is being slaves to technology, and that's really what he becomes. He becomes the slave of technology. Right, but you know, she was a uh, she was a radio personality, <laughs> right? Like she talked yep. to people on the radio. Talk radio back yeah. then. Eric Bogosian, talk radio. Oh my god, it was so weird. Yeah. She was in this like little like uh, room, and I was like, this looks like something out of a sci-fi channel. Seventies and eighties, that was like the boom of radio, FM talk but radio. Did, but especially. you know, the like the entrance to the thing was like a circle, mm. and it just looked weird. Like it did oh, not that look real. Stuff is gone now. It's just amazing. Oh. I mean, it's still there. It's just it had its heyday, and now it's been yeah. you know. Well, I mean, there's still talk radio. It's just it's more political talk radio, and not. Well, even know. that is pretty much gone. It's 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 moved off to you know serious uh, serious and, stuff, and yeah. the other stuff. It's all yeah. digital, and it's 
it's not it's not the same as it was. But there is still like my parents still listen to the regular radio and shit. So it exists for old fogies like and, like NPR still exists. Right, right. The but regular. there's not much really that's out there, especially for free, which is no. another big thing. Back in the eighties, you could turn on the TV, you could turn on the radio and get all this stuff. You didn't have to subscribe to anything. Mm. You can't even watch football or baseball or sports unless you belong to specific packages on cable or, or on the internet. Back then, you could just put them on. No, that that the cable. world doesn't cable, exist anymore. Cable's dying, you know? Like, it's yeah. not, you know, I still have satellite, but, like, I don't really watch it that much. I watch Roku, you know? And so, I like, I just, it's it's a completely different world, and I think we cable just... Cable needs to die. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, because there's really no, no point to it anymore. I mean, it's, it's they got just, way too greedy, and they were all on giving you shit you didn't really want in the first place. No. They only wanted like two or three things, and they gave us five hundred. Ninety nine percent of it we didn't want. And nine, yeah, yeah. The, I mean, there might be other people who want it or whatever, but then there's the other people who don't. You know, so I don't know. Anyway, uh, so then um, basically. So after she kind of talks to him and and whatnot, he sort of goes into this, like, I don't know, craziness. But he gets a he gets a call, a message that, um, oh yeah, no. So he gets a message that he's got to meet with this guy. I forgot his name. Um, the uh, what's his? Uh, yeah, the salesman guy. The salesman guy. Um, and I don't I don't know the. Now uh, that's the one thing that they could have brought out a little bit more. Because I sensed there was a connection between the glasses that he was peddling and their device. Right. And I wasn't sure if it was because it was to make you more susceptible or that was that was going to be the next thing for the headset. It was going to be through the glasses. Or if that was glasses that would protect certain people from the waves that were giving you the, the, the uh, brain, brain tumor. So I always th- I thought when I was watching it that it was just a front for his other stuff, you know? Yeah, see, so I think that, it was more than a front, I think. You think so? Yeah. Okay, because I only got it as a front, so now that you're saying that, maybe, I mean, I, I get that, so it could have been more, but... Because that's the whole thing with the with the government or whoever it was that's part of the government wants to take it to the next stage, which is to bring it out to that's everyone. That's true, that's why they did that, uh, that trade show and right. stuff, and he was showing off his, he was going to show off his new glasses or new... New stuff, his new wear. Taking uh, it to the next stage. Yeah, and unfortunately, well, fortunately, maybe, whatever yeah. you want to call it, he didn't get that chance. But anyway, so yeah, so you see that, you know, he gets a limo, goes in a limo, which has a little TV, you know, and so he goes in there and he talks to, he meets the guy, and, um, you know, at the, uh, at the, the optical place or whatever, his. Uh, spectacular optical. Spectacular optical. And meets with the guy, and he's checking out one of the glasses. He's looking at one of the glasses, like, "Oh, this is this is going to be one of our new lines." And you know, this is, you know, blah blah blah. He ta- talks about it a little bit. So maybe it was, maybe that was. I think it was. Was something cool that they were going to do with it. Um, then he uh, says, "Look, um, you're hallucinating right now. We don't know what you're what you're seeing, what you're not seeing. So what we want to do is we want to check on you." And uh, see what you're doing, but the only way we could do that is to play you like S and M, you know, stuff to kind of stimulate your mind to make you uh, do that. So he puts the headset on, he starts thinking of, uh, and the guy says he wants to leave. I was like, oh, of course you want to leave. You don't want to, mm-hmm. you don't want to be around. Like that's you know. And, and that's where maybe I'm conflating the movie with a little bit with They Live because they they have the glasses there that lets you see you know reality, whereas. In this, it's more like it almost feels like the glasses are going to be the next thing that are going to accept the signals. And if you've got the glasses, it accepts the signals, and it's going to it's going to be able to control you and show you what they want you to see. Right. So he ends up, uh, you know, hallucinating, and like at first he's whipping uh, his girl, the Deborah Harry TV character. set. Really, he's whipping the TV <laughs> set, and then we find out it's the uh, the agent lady. Agent lady, ugh. and then. He uh, he wakes up at home, you know, and uh, and that's where I like where I became like thinking like, is this all just a VR trip, you know? But no, I guess not. I guess 
they dropped him off at home after he had the the crazy VR trip. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, and I guess he crashed or something, fell asleep. And when he woke up, he thought that the chick was next to him. The Mm -hmm. agent lady was next to him, handcuffed and dead. Right. And uh, so he freaks out. And he calls his buddy, the uh, the guy from Harlan, Harlan who's the guy who uh, helped crack the It's thing. a little bit like Existence. I don't know if you've ever saw Existence. Existence? Yeah. Okay, I've never... It's, I know of it. I know uh, David Cronenberg did it, yeah, too, right? It's, yeah, it's similar, except that that's a little bit more like, um, you know, uh, that that's a little bit more like the, the um, what do you call it, the... Uh, the video game slash um, right. internet version. So he comes up and uh, his buddy, he wants his buddy to go in there and video, you know, photograph the dead body so that he could prove that he's not going crazy, you know, or whatever. It well, he's going crazy because it ain't there. And so he says, all right, well, um, you know, I, I need you to meet me at the at your place and begin to look a little fight. Which is so funny because that guy was like, is like his freak out. I know like his really freak, freak out, out was just like really small. He raised his voice. He raised his voice a little bit, but he seemed like the most calm guy in the whole movie. Yeah. Well, and it turns out there's a reason for that. Yeah. So he goes, all right, I'll uh, I'll, I'll meet you at my place and everything. And he says, you know, so did you check? He meets him there at his uh, work. And he said, did you watch the new video drone? And the guy. The guy's like, uh, there was no new f- video drum. Oh, In fact, there never was one. There never was one. He's and like, then, what? And then that's when the other guy comes out, and they, he finds out they've been in cahoots the whole time. But there have been. So what, what is going on? Like, Well, there haven't been. No, he, he remember, Harlan was the one who told him all about the, the broadcast and everything. Well, they never existed. He's been giving him special di- uh, video things the whole time. And that's why he's the only one who's seen it, and Harlan hasn't. You know, remember he keeps asking if he's seen it. And he's like, "Oh, I I didn't see it." No. You know, he's been feeding it to him the whole time because he was there for two years. The government planted him two years ago to get to him, and that's why, why they. Did he get, I mean, why him? Why? Because so they could take over his station, and that's why they did it is to brainwash him, have him kill his partners, then get rid of Bianca uh, uh, Oblivion, and that that's going to pave the way for them to do their next phase and. He ends up subverting the whole thing. You know, yeah. He plays along. Well, and, he plays along for a little bit, yeah. and then, uh, yeah. So we'll get to that in a second. But yeah, he. So he. Uh, yeah, I just. Uh. It's it's multi layered. There's a lot going on. It it's, takes a few viewings to, to pick up everything. I know, and and the biggest thing with that is like, you know, he's watching the tape. He's watching the the, the people like hitting, but the guy guys is looking at the television. Mm-hmm. I think when he's looking at him, and he's saying. You know, um, the, oh, they just do the same thing over and over again, mm-hmm. right? And stuff. So he sees it. He sees um, video drone. That's the thing that's confusing. So he saw it too. That his friend Harlan at saw at least it. a little bit of it. So when he be affected by it, In at theory. least looking at it at all, like unless like unless that unless that was a hallucination that he was having the, of his. Francine. He's also wearing gla- <laughs> Harlan is also wearing glasses, so maybe he's got the glasses that protect him. That's true. He's got the optical. Yeah, th- and that's opticals. the thing. They they you don't really get that kind of information about it, so you have to sort of fill in your own blanks a little bit. I'd love to hear. I'm pretty sure David Cronenberg is on there. Ta- I think he probably talks about. There's two audio some, commentaries. Yeah. One in featuring Cronenberg and director of photography. So that would be fascinating to hear about. And that. the uh, and the others, the actors, uh, James Woods and uh, Deborah Harry. Yeah, that would anyway. be great. So there are answers. I just haven't gone through all of that yet. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there you go. Um, <laughs> so it's got. All right, so uh, after that, uh, after he has that talk with the the, the big they, guy, they put a new cassette they put into a new, him, a new cassette right into, into his him, chest, where his gun was. Mm-hmm. See, he had put a gun into his. Uh, then you even said, oh, "Thank God he didn't put his keys in there." <laughs> he would have lost his keys, but he put his gun in there. So, uh, but it was all a setup because they were they were they were using him they were programming him as uh, Bianca uh, 
it says, Gone yep. to Oblivion. So he goes up there and uh, he ends up going to, um, uh, like, they tell him basically go kill your, you know, your uh, partners and stuff. So he goes up to his partners. He only has two partners, I guess, and they're both waiting for him to come in and they're talking about some new new project and they want to talk to him about it or whatever and he comes in and just shoots them uh, both and uh, and as he does that you know he kind of puts it away and his assistant just lets him like secretary just kind of comes in and yeah I think she's not sure what's going on she, and she sees thinks him that maybe yeah maybe like he got shot or something yeah so she hides him you get the impression that she's always liked him and yeah. She wants to help him. But at the very last second, I think she sees that there's really nothing wrong with him. And she's kind of shocked. And he just looks at her and just, it's like he, he doesn't say anything. But he, yeah. he, his, his eyes kind of say sorry. And he runs off. He runs off. And then he ends up, um, the next one they want to kill is uh, Bianca. Bianca. Yeah. And so he goes to Bianca's place. Because he's programmed. Yeah. But... He has a weird, he, there's a weird part in it where he's kind of saying, you know, he like introduces himself again, but he's met her like two or three mm. times. So like, why did he have to like, intro, like, she knows who he is. The only thing I can think of is that because they've programmed him, that was part of the program. Was for him to say that? Yeah. So he starts talking to her, blah, blah, blah about it. And, uh, and she says that, you know, basically if, uh. You know, uh, you don't have to do what they want you to do. You can basically do whatever you want. So he ends up, and then they end up whatever. Because uh, death to video drill. If he's been programmed, then sh she can deprogram, which is what she does. Except, what she doesn't tell him is that she's now programmed him again, but for their benefit, for her benefit. Yeah. So uh, she goes. Yeah. So for her benefit, so it's death to video drill. Mm. And uh, long live the new, new flesh. flesh. And so he is now off to kill the the, the main guy. The, well, at yeah. first he goes he goes to the optical place to find the guy, and runs into his buddy Harlan, who's there too. Which I'm wondering was has he been doing both like going to both work at both jobs? Yeah, I think I so. I guess yeah. you know. But it's it's very similar to like people who they have certain political beliefs because they've been watching this TV show or this listening to this radio show all this time. And then all of a sudden, they go a new program and a new show, and it just changes their political views. Now they're on the other side. And it's, it's very yep. similar. It's like you're being, you're being pulled from one side to the other without really having your own individual thing. You're just being used by, by different sides. You're, you're a slave to technology. Right. So he goes to the place, and he ends up, I guess he ends up blowing up that guy or something somehow. Like, yeah. Yeah, he ends up... Uh, at, first, the, at first, Harlan tries to put a new tape into him. And as he's doing it, he's getting like... You know, like something's happening to his arm. And he comes out and he has like this really... It's like a grenade. Little fucked up hand. Uh, it's like, yeah. And so he goes up there and he's uh, pushing him away. Like the guy's walking away from him. And then uh, he ends up just blowing up. Or whatever. Not very convincing explosion, by the way, but you know, it was nineteen eighties, and uh, <laughs> even though they, it was a Universal Pictures movie, which I was very surprised. Uh, I think Universal just put it out. I don't know if they produced it. No, I don't think they produced it. They just uh, put it out. Yeah, because back in those days, that's what they did. Like a lot of these companies, they needed they needed projects like this. They needed something that was a little bit more independent mm. that they could they could market and, and whatnot. That's what they need now. Honestly, Universal, uh, you know, Warner Brothers, all you guys need to just hire independent filmmakers to go out and make mo content that isn't so expensive and then, you know, make your fucking money back and then, you know, make a profit. Like, it's just, anyway, uh, I'm a slave to technology. <laughs> I'm a slave to the movie stuff. Um, so he ends up uh, going up against uh, or finding out that the guy's on a trade show. So he goes to the trade show in Pittsburgh, um, you know, and he goes to the trade show. He ends up seeing the guy at a at this like nice little, I don't know. It's not not any trade show I'm used to. It's kind of like a, a nice by early '80s standards. Restaurants. <laughs> it was a nice restaurant, like a bar I guess. and 
very I, overdone, very 80s style, very yeah. cringy. So the guy goes and uh, takes his gun out and shoots the shoots the Harlan, uh, wait, not Harlan, uh, no, the, uh, the boss, whatever his yeah, name is. And he kind of dissolves. And he kind of dissolves, and then, um, uh, and then he has to, he has one last mission, basically, to, to end this all, which is to kill himself. Mm -hmm. And then he... Transform himself into the new flesh. Yeah, so he kills himself first, and then it's not real. So he does it again. And I'm like thinking, is this real? Because he still had the hand like that, you mm -hmm. know? I'm like, but it just ends. So I'm like, all right, I guess that was real. I guess that was it. Um, so yeah, so this... So yeah, so let's talk a little bit about what this comes with. We already mentioned that it's got, so this is the director approved 4K and Blu-ray special edition of Videodrome. Uh, it's got the two um, uh, commentaries. It's also got an essay by writers, Ricky, uh, Carrie Ricky, Tim Lucas, and Gary Indiana. So that's, I believe, what that is. Yep. Um, and then it's, it's got a whole bunch of other stuff, too. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of this is very tiny scripts. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll read it. I know you're, you've got trouble with it. It's got a, uh, so two audio commentary tracks, uh, fe the, as I said, featuring Cronenberg and director of photography, Mark Irwin. The other actors, uh, Jim, Jim Woods and uh, Deborah Harry. There's a short film Ooh. called Camera but in 2000 by Cronenberg. Maybe we'll do that for yeah. uh, Short Film Saturday this, uh, this month. Um, Forging the New Flesh, uh, video, oh, was it Forging the New Flesh? A short documentary by filmmaker Michael Linick about video drums, video, and prosthetic uh, makeup effects. Effects Men, an audio interview with makeup effects creator Rick, Rick Baker, Baker baby. and video effects supervisor Linick. Bootleg video, the complete footage of Samurai Dreams, and seven <laughs> minutes of other transmissions from video drums. Samurai Dreams was the weird soft porn Japanese thing yeah. that was inside them. The show, the show within the show. Yeah, presented in their original unedited form with filmmaker uh, commentary. Uh, Fear on Film, a roundtable discussion with from 1982 with Cronenberg, filmmakers uh, John Carpenter, John Landis, and Mick Garris. Nice, nice, That's nice, That's a nice. great roundtable. And it's interesting because there's another part. I mean, there's so many movies that it referenced or that I remember read, you know, referencing this movie. Like eight millimeter, that whole part where she's talking about this channel is like snuff TV, and you're just like sort of watching this depraved stuff. I'm thinking I'm waiting for Nick Cage to walk out any second now and start investigating. You yeah, know, it was it was you know that kind of level of stuff, and you can definitely see you, can you definitely know see in, that in, movie like took from this. Yeah, yeah. It definitely influenced it. Yeah, there's um, there's among definitely others. inspiration. Um, I. I liked it. Um, I, um, I'm very happy. I own it on, um, I own it on Blu-ray, so I'm happy to. I, I will upgrade to 4K at some point because you gotta have all your David Cronenberg movies be 4K, you know, or whatever. visually definitely because he's yeah. definitely a visual person, he's a, a visual definitely director. So definitely a much visual. Definitely do do. I mean, you know, Rafiga Boo Boo would be great on 4K, but I don't know that it's gonna actually make the experience any better. <laughs> I'd love it though. <laughs> But yeah, for maybe David, if they just tucked it and made it two parts, because that's what it was. It was so, two different movies. But David Cronenberg, it's definitely worth it uh, for the visuals alone. Yeah, well, I I really enjoy the visuals, the effects. Like Rip Baker did a fantastic job with the effects. I mean, just the body hard. Although was, you know, I can't help but also notice that some of the some of the flaws are also magnified. Like when you initially see uh, Woods and he's got his brand new pouch. And he's got his hand in there for the first time. You could definitely see that there are skin tonal differences between his real arm and the prosthetic stuff. You know, there's yeah. certain things that that end up standing out a little bit more because of the technology back then. So yeah, I can understand why there are folks who they wait until stuff can get like they take the extra time and money and effort to blend in stuff and make it go away. You know. That's why, you know, Lucas ended up redoing Star Wars and why other uh, folks have ended up... No, Lucas stuck. started redoing Star Wars because 
he had a dream of all these different things he wanted to do but didn't have the technology at the time to do it so he just put that ship in there like the characters that are in like the cantina scene weren't none of them were in there and then just wacky stupid you know mm -hmm. uh annoying cgi or whatever you know kind of created characters who i just think is just i think he was just an annoying you know because then he goes but this is my movie and i'm like dude once you've made it and put it out there it's everybody's yeah, movie yeah, it's yeah. not just yours it's dude. it's just you know kind of a double-edged sword where um it's obviously going to make the visuals better but it's also going to show off some of the flaws a little bit more too and that's yeah. that's just part and parcel you know it's just you know we've talked about this before even john ward has mentioned that there are certain movies where the experience is better when it's a little fuzzy a little pixelated it, it just you it don't was, really want the clarity up, yeah yeah it just looks it doesn't have that same effect mm -hmm. like when you know take a movie like video drum where the um if you open this up looks like a video cassette yeah you know it looks like a beta max. we still have video cassettes it here look like beta yeah, max film cafe of course we do but like, there you go so you get yeah see it's beta max because it's got the two little things right here i think i feel like but like look you look at this it looks like a tape and um and that those are the sort of movies that um you look at these things and you look at um they feel scuzzy they feel because this is what this movie's about it's mm -hmm. about those movies and that, that are scuzzy and pervy and disgusting and and everything those what he wants because those are what his patrons are paying for they want they they want to watch the audience that wants to watch them they want to watch people get killed. They mm. want to watch people get raped. Sadly, uh, you know, I don't. You know, uh, and we've talked about this because you hate the movie Blood Sucking Freaks, which you say is a really disgusting kind of show, you know, or movie because it, it shows people like trying to enjoy this kind of stuff and it doesn't make you feel, makes you feel icky and stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this movie sort of had that feel of like, that's what that was what they were trying to go with is trying to do a show or have a show that made you feel the worst like ickiest grossest or whatever they're like that's you know but this one you know you're feeling icky right. whereas the other one it was more like oh isn't this cool isn't this fun and well, it's like so no <laughs> you look at this but no 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 but i'm saying the movies that they were trying to show like uh, like Videodrome itself, the TV show or whatever. Yeah, would that have was, been that. That kind would of have film. been that kind yeah. of thing where it turned, it turned that one girl on. Like that is the gross. pervy girl, right? right. That's gross. Blood there's, sucking there's, freaks there's, probably there's, did that. Right. There's a reason why blood sucking freaks was the number one prison rental of right. all time. So <laughs> it's gross and disgusting and, and violent disturbing and, and awful. violent and and that was what this movie was supposed to be showing you was like this is not People this is not what we that. should be be doing well we again it's the effects of, against this. of overstimulation you know right. the idea that you know you watch porn but then that becomes not enough and so you start to watch the extreme porn and then that's not enough what comes next after that you know yeah you get jaded after a while and then know, all of it, and then it also blends into reality and you start thinking you know, people that watch some of that porn that gets really involved in that mm -hmm. porn, they'll start, especially extreme porn, they might start strangling their their significant other and to try to, like, mimic that It's shit. human nature because we do the same thing with drugs. We do the same thing with alcohol. We do the same thing with anything that gives us a little bit of pleasure. Food, you know, you, you, you love the cookies, you eat the cookies, now you need to have more cookies and then it leads are, to are, more Are you more. saying that they need a VA? Uh, <laughs> They need a Videodrome uh, Anonymous, drum. Videodrome Anonymous or yeah. something. But that's that's what he's tapping into is that part of us that, you know, we find something, but then it's not enough and we have to keep going. We keep the we keep going for the overstimulation. Right. You know? So, uh, yeah. So anyway, it was it's a crazy movie. Uh, I I really enjoyed it. Um, it's gonna take a few watches, I think, for most people to really enjoy it. And I think I'd, I'd like the commentary too. I'd like to hear what dying um, to hear the commentary. Yeah, I think hearing David Cronenberg actually discuss why you know the messages a little bit more, maybe be a little bit more clear. 
I think that would be that would be great. But I, I mean, think about Crash. Wasn't that people having sex at, at car accidents? Mm-hmm. I mean, that if, if talk about an extreme freaking over you know stimulation. I can't think of anything more than that. And disturbing. Yeah, and disturbing. I mean, I would not be because regular on sex. By car crash. Regular sex wasn't cutting it. <laughs> I know, and so maybe that's that's a theme that he likes is like you know. I think so. The idea of is overstimulation bad for you scanners i think had a little bit of that too so and rabid yeah so i think he's i think he has a he has a thing he has a theme with a lot and he certainly utilizes body horror in a lot of of those movies too and body horror is horror is interesting because it is some of the ickiest and most disturbing horror that's out there it's also tends to be the most um special effects and makeup driven so you got to have people who really know what they're doing For it to be effective and to be really horrifying. You have to have the new Rick Baker. Yeah. You know, Um, otherwise it just turns out bad. And especially it it really lends itself well to practical effects. I haven't really seen much body horror stuff that where it's done well CGI. So, yeah. I would definitely recommend Videodrome if you Mm -hmm. haven't seen it. um, If you haven't seen it, then I don't know why you listen to us. If you love the New York City in the 70s and 80s. This is another one, too. This is another love letter to, we were to watching that it. period in time. He was talking about the, the New York. I said, oh, my God, it's New York in the 80s. Wolfen, of Prince like of the that. City. You know, all those movies that showed off the city back then in a bygone era. French Connection, yep. which was 70s. And yep. All this stuff back then just showed. And notice there was no cops in this movie, really. They didn't. They, didn't they had so. one. They had the guy. There was one cop, a motorcycle cop, in the uh, towards the end when he was in the glasses shop he was sitting in the back oh well, i don't remember that yeah. yeah that was the only one yeah they really didn't like make the focus about but it was funny because he's 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 like wanted by the law at one point he's because he shot around. his uh people and he shot him i mean there's a tv out in the middle of like the street Next to a beggar. Beggar. And the beggar is... Come on, Teddy. Saying, Come on, Teddy. <laughs> Teddy. Give and me some change, like, Teddy. Yeah, he. I guess he thought he was somebody else or something. I don't know. Or maybe that's just the name he gives every guy that he randomly sees. And, and my monkey. Teddy just Funny keeps going, you know, leaving him alone and going uh, straight. I didn't even see a monkey, so I don't know what he was talking about. And then he was talking... Uh, and on the screen was basically, hey, this is the man who shot you know these people this is the gun he has and all that and stuff. he's right he's next him. to it he's right next to him and he's kind of like i think at one point he kind of looks down <laughs> you know funny. right and he like notices it you know and the, the the other guy doesn't like even pay attention <laughs> and there's no cops running around no so cops nobody cares i mean they care i guess but they're like probably other shit going on too well and they you know again that was the period where it was they just didn't have enough you know the right. city was broke they didn't have enough cops the cops they had were corrupt yeah it was it was a bad situation bad for law enforcement on the other hand good for you know times when you know you could actually afford to live in the city because rents were cheap and a lot of artists and creative people were there and lots of great movies came out of there lots time. of great movies lots of great music lots Basket of great art case was lots of great everything new york i think all so, that's gone yeah mm. wonderful stuff but anyway anywho the point is that it it was a really good movie i liked it um i i'm happy that i own it because i'll probably watch it again i well i would listen to the commentary i think the next time and uh or check out some of the special features yeah i'd love to check out some of those um, I'm very happy you, you chose this movie of all, and I'm not surprised. And so, uh, by the next time that we do one with him, he'll have more to choose from too. Is this one that Just Jen could sit through? I don't think so. I don't, <laughs> I don't think so. Just because it's too gross. I think and, she could sit through it. I just don't think she'd enjoy it. Yeah, and she probably would enjoy the, like. I mean, I think she'd enjoy the message because it actually has a political like real message Mm -hmm. and that was what i was telling paul before was like nowadays most movies don't have a message at all well or at least they don't have that kind of a message they they have these social messages but they're very uh, ham-handed very ham-handed about how they do it but i'm like talking about horror horror a lot of times don't like you know it's just a lot of times especially indie route a lot of it's just people it's, going around killing people. It's very people. surface. That's it. That's yeah. it. Like, that's what I don't like. That's why I was, you know, yeah. that's why I don't like slasher movies. That's generally what it is. It's just that and that's it. 
Well, and you look at a movie like Scream, that had a, that has social commentary about how we we watch too many horror movies and, and stuff, and we kind of, you know, we get into this. Scream like, was kind of the thing. first meta horror film. Yeah, and, the, uh, and then after that it became like everybody just did the same thing that, you know, was Scream. Um, but, you know, I, I guess the people that do do like this stuff, like hey, that. Like, do do. Yeah. Uh, like uh, you know, like I said, the guy before, like the guy did the witch, and uh, the guy is the lobster. Those guys do like horror and have a sort of a some kind of message that they really want to to make sure people get. But across. at the same time, they have a great story with well written characters and a narrative that makes sense to help bring that message home. Whereas a lot of these other movies. It's all about the message first, and they don't care about the story, and that's the problem. Yeah, you know? it's like, how are we going to tell people that we want to make sure, like, we know that, you know, this, 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 and this is happening. I, I'm, I'm open to specific. any, you know, story or any message you want to give me, but you better wrap it up in a good story, because that's the whole point of the movie in the first place. Mm -hmm. And if you don't attend to that, it's not going to be good. Mm -mm. I don't care what your message is. No, sir. So, there you go. Uh, definitely watch it for the message and for the uh, the movie itself. I think there's I'm a gonna... lot of messages in this one, so you might, like I said, might take a couple of viewings before yeah. you you can get through it all. But it's well worth it. Viewings as in like you watch it once, then you're like, yeah, let me I, chew I on it a bit, watch chew, it again, yeah, watch it again. And I mean, this is something I could see watching over and over again because it'll probably now that you've seen all the way to the end. You can kind of look back and go, okay, wait, what? How did that work? What did that, you know, is that is that real? Is that not real? Mm -hmm. Like, did he ever kill that lady? And I no. miss movies that you have to chew on a little bit. That it's not just instant gratification and that's it. He never sees the Asian no. lady again. So did he kill her for real somewhere? And it just wasn't at his house. Mm -hmm. Or you know, I mean, who knows? So. It is open ended and uh, and very um, you know uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, my brain doesn't work anymore. Yeah, and poor you know poor ambiguous. Yeah, poor uh, Deborah Harry's character. It, well, she's the one who asked to watch the uh, video drum, and, <laughs> and you got and, any porno? <laughs> yeah, she asked for the porno first, and then he's like, uh, uh, he's like really you know <laughs> like and she's he's like she's like what about video drone it really turns and, me on i'm like okay like even that's, death that's, that's and good and, to know torture turns her on and shit so that was that was so weird but um, she freely admits she's uh overstimulated you yeah. know that's you know that's part and of the she, thing she's giving advice to all these people yet not taking her own advice mm -hmm. i think a lot of that had something you know there's something there to be said about that so i don't know it's just a, it's just a crazy ass movie, man. I, like well I said, done. I thought of like even though I hadn't seen it, I knew this was a what the fuck kind of movie. So I thought about what the fuck Friday for it, and then I was like, oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you did it for Criterion Watch because it's a Criterion film and it deserves to be talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, we'll do Scanners, I'm sure. Oh you know. yeah, um, but and uh, a few other Cronenberg's got some really good stuff. Yeah, Cronenberg and Lynch both do a lot with Criterion. Mm -hmm. So um, go check a lot of their stuff out. Um, but anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Let me know what you guys think. Um, have you seen Videodrome? If not, why did you listen to our... If you have, raise your hand. I still don't know who did that. <laughs> it was not me. It wasn't me. It was Joe. Joe Turk was one of the last I ones here. I think he did it itself. So let's like, like not think that way. <laughs> Or is it really here? Well, it could be. Or Someone, is it not really someone's here? Someone's giving us a hand. I don't know who it is. <laughs> All right, everybody. Hope you guys enjoyed this. And we will be back next month with a brand new episode of Criterion Watch. Until then, everybody. Bye. He's waving bye-bye.
Now.